Hello and welcome to Self-Publishing Insiders with Drafts to Digital. My name is Mark and I am the Director of Business Development and I am your host for today's episode and I am so honored to have with me Jeff and Michaela in the studio to talk about content for everyone. Welcome gentlemen. Thank you Mark. Thanks for having us here. Now just before we went live, uh, you guys basically were saying that you were just recently at a conference related to accessibility. Do you want to kick off and talk a little bit about that? Because was, we were just about to talk about it and I went, oh no, look, we have to go live. <laughs> we'll just bring the conversation to everybody. <laughs> That's right. We'll bring the content for everyone. That's very on, very on par. That here. was on brand, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we both had the opportunity as part of our day job with a company called UsableNet to go to the CSUN Assistive Technology Conference, uh, which okay. was in its 38th year. CSUN is Cal State University Northridge. Okay. Uh, and that particular branch of California State University has a large program around accessibility and accessible technology. Okay, And it was great to be really immersed in this even more than we usually are for five days of five uh, whole days four and a half depending on when you got there but yeah it was <laughs> okay. it was a week-long conference with i mean 10 sessions an hour i think it was so you could split up among so many different you know aspects of accessibility <clears throat> yeah and it really looks at everything from not just digital accessibility that we focus on in the book but uh you know accessibility in physical space uh, yeah. things like that. And I actually sat in two sessions around EPUB 3, which of course is coming for authors very soon if they're not already generating those. Right. And also as it fits in with the new uh, accessibility laws in Europe, where even eBooks must be accessible by 2025 to be sold okay. in stores. Wow. So interesting stuff to hear on all, all fronts. Is that how is that affecting the US? I know Europe has the very stringent laws about privacy and obviously some great new laws about EPUB, but how's that affecting us on this side of the pond? You know, for authors, and I'm not an attorney and not giving legal advice in this moment. Okay. <laughs> it, 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 it's such a wild, wild west here in the US because there aren't a lot of laws around this. There's a lot of things okay. that they try to leverage the ADA, for example, the American with Disabilities Act, to create lawsuits around accessibility. We talk a little bit about this in the book too. Um, but because generally authors and creatives don't have a store that they run themselves and don't do those things, there's it really is a lot on e-commerce. So the risk is low currently. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised to see the U.S. move in some of the ways that your, Europe has. And Mick, I mean, you're, you're in Europe. You might have a little more perspective on some of the European laws as well. Yeah, I think that the yeah the, the European laws are, are are clear, are very clear, as clear as, for example, the American uh, law that has been. Uh, I mean, the American mandate has been defined by the Department of Transportation that is regulating the. Uh, accessibility level of all the uh, websites for airlines traveling to the United States. So the, the the good of the European side that the rules are clear. I think there is also a, a clear effort of all the government to make uh, accessibility not just a, a legal aspect, so not just the uh, around the legal risk, but a lot is invested into the ethical value. And I think that that was also um, interesting to, uh, to 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 find at the at the CSUN conference, where if in the past uh, uh, we were hearing a lot of sessions around the importance of conformance, the importance of compliance, the importance of mitigating the legal risks, this year uh, there has been a lot of focus on uh, sensitizing people to do something. Uh, you know that what you have to do. You know what you have to do in order to protect yourself from against legal risks. But actually, there are real people there that need to access your website. You want to call it as a business opportunity. You want to call it as the right thing to, to do. You want to call it as common sense. So there was this, uh, uh, let's say, improvement in the, in the message and in the let's say, in the size of uh, 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 the number of angles uh, accessibility was considered, which I think was was positive. I mean, I like a sort of maturity of the companies, actually, that are embracing accessibility and are uh, divulgating the concepts on, this, on accessibility. 
to find a better way to have everyone understanding what they have to do, why they have, what they have to do, and which are the opportunities associated to this topic. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to go to specifically, you guys just recently in the last month released a book, and obviously I want to pop that up and it'll hide me for a second, but I think it's important for people to see content for everyone. So you guys co-authored this book, but I want to get back into your backstory about how you two met, because I believe that the, the day job uh, has a lot to do with why you put this book together, right? It does. I never thought of a world where my day job would connect to, you know, my creative side as much as this one has over the past few years. Right. You know, I've, I met Michele when I joined usable net back in 2010. So I've been, you know, with this company for a while now. Uh, and Michele has been there even longer than I have. <laughs> uh, but in our job, we talk about accessibility all day long because we're helping companies around the world with their accessibility programs. At the same time, you know, I, worked on the sites that I have for my podcast, for my, for my writing, you know, for those efforts, because it would be hypocritical for me to tell people about accessibility and not make my web properties the most accessible that I can, which is some of where this started to take root because I'm not technical. I could tell you about accessibility all day long and what you need to do. I can't necessarily do all of it. So, you know, I'm using the same tools a lot of indie authors are. I my word my my websites are in WordPress. I use MailerLite for my email marketing and I'm on, you know, the various social platforms. There are things I can do that can help make those more accessible than they might be if I just, you know, on a whim designed and threw stuff up there any way that I want. And so I'm like, one day I was like, I'm going to write a book about this because I see my colleagues creating this content in a way that is not accessible for a number of reasons. And they don't know any better. Nobody sets out to create content that, you know, someone's going to feel not included in because they can't either see it or hear it or, you know, perceive it in the way that they need to. And I mentioned this to Michele one day that I was going to do this thing. And very quickly it became a co-authoring project for us. And, you know, <laughs> Mick, you could give your story on why you jumped on it because yeah, it's, it's also awesome. your first book. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And uh, yeah, there are definitely my story has a lot of intersections with yours. <laughs> Not surprisingly, I would say. Um, yeah, I think that the as part of uh, Jeff and my job, um, we. we invest a lot of time educating our customer, our clients, uh, not necessarily on uh, only on technical aspects on how to remediate, how to resolve, how to test accessibility. But a lot of our focus uh, is on, on processes. So how to educate a company to modify and amend their processes, their ways of working in order to make accessibility sustainable. So we are constantly exposed to um, this need of teaching people on uh, why they need to do accessibility, how they can make it in a way that is not always a final test that you do after you complete your work. So I think that this, this project related to the book is very much in line with this education concept. So it might not be the ultimate goal in terms of accessibility, but educating people uh, to play their role, do they part uh, on, on accessibility, it is, is simply increasing the, the size of the population that knows that this needs to be done and will we'll make uh, the message just spreading around and consequently, it will be easier for everyone just make accessibility as part of the way they work. And so I want to I want to dig into that a little bit. So it almost feels like when you're thinking about accessibility, it's not an after after the fact. Oh, now that we've done all this, let's make it accessible. But it's it's part and parcel of the, the process, right? Where you, when you're thinking about it from the beginning, how did that impact the way that you guys you know wrote this book together and 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 planned out the release strategy, et cetera? 
That's a complex question. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I should have broken it yeah. down. But I, I, I just like because I want authors to be thinking about that early on. Like when you're thinking about you think about a lot of things, you know, before you write the book. Yeah, I think the way we tried to approach it, because it's definitely one of the things we have to talk about with our clients, too. We may give our client a list of, of a thousand things, more than a thousand things to fix. And you've got to break it down into, you know, smaller pieces. And I, the consistent theme, I think, through the book is it'd be great if you went backwards and fixed stuff. And we tell you how to look at your existing, especially your website, to find, you know, the things that might be wrong. But it's also about, okay, now I understand how to create good alternative text for a picture when I'm posting it. I know now how to create things with good color contrast. And it's doing it going forward. Right. There's this, this idea of progress over perfection. We're not ever really going to hit perfection. We're going to forget to do something. We're going to not make a correct choice in a moment or you know whatever that thing is. It's about starting to do something and going forward. So you may only start with good alternative text across your social posts. Okay. Move that to your website and then try to take on the idea of good color contrast and and try to move in that direction with things. So it's not, oh my God, I have all of these new things to do as I'm writing my book and doing my marketing and you know all these things. It's about learning what you can do and figuring out how to fit that into your process to ultimately be able to include more of your audience and potential audience at all the things you're doing. Yeah, if I can add one thing, I I guess that the the common theme across the book is the question, have you also considered what? Have you also considered if your color palette makes sense for somebody that cannot distinguish uh, the colors as, as you can do? Okay. Have you considered that a color scheme that you like might not be perceived by other people. Have you considered that if you, I don't know, upload a video and the audio in that video is fundamental to understand the message, have you considered somebody might not be able to hear that sound? Right. Uh, so these are all the kind of questions that we would like to to ask and, um, and recommend uh, people to ask themselves. If we, uh, let's say, perceive the book as, like Jeff was saying, just a, a final check and then I have to go back, as we said before, that becomes like a, a tough, tough topic. So the idea is to educate, to bring accessibility as early as possible. Right. Uh, we, we always recommend to, to practice your ability to perceive whether something is accessible or not. When you open, next time you open a door, do you feel the handle is accessible? Is designed in a way that can you allow that allows you to open the door in the quickest quickest way possible? If you have, I don't know, a bag in your um, you hold the bag uh, with your main hand. If you are in a rush, yeah, yeah. ask yourself those questions. Okay, so I you reminded me of something that I think is important, and I know you've got some great resources in the book, but you also have a website. Says so when you talk about the color palette, it's a simple thing that the average person, okay, so Alyssa, who works in our team, understands design, color palettes, all that stuff, right? She designs all our all our graphics and everything, so she has a good handle on that. But the rest of us, well, I think that looks good. But you guys have some some resources in the book, but also on on your website. Is that correct for uh, for finding these? Correct. We're, we're doing at least weekly blog posts on various things around okay. accessibility. And for people who, who have the book, there's also a number of th times from the book we send you into the website to see, you know, expanded examples of things, things okay. that would be very hard to like, you know, be able to put together properly in either, you know, a paperback or an ebook or whatever it is. Because um, you want to, you kind of want to see it in the web environment, also to kind of understand how some of these concepts work. Right. Um, so yeah, we're, we have that, and then also point the way to some uh, resources as well. There's a great color contrast checker, for example, so that you can always, you know, take the hex codes for your background and your text and put them into the checker, and you know, does it pass? minimum contrast requirements so that people have a at least a fighting chance of being able to read it if they're engaging visually 
Oh, I love that. I love that. And so the book is available now, right? It's available in print. I'm assuming large print as well. Absolutely. Print, <laughs> large print, ebook, e audiobook still to come. Audiobook is 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 en route. And 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 that sort of leads to a, something that I had an aha moment not that long before this book came out and I became aware of the book and, and started to read it was uh, one of my nonfiction books for writers. I had this thought of, okay, I'm going to do the audio myself because I'm. it's a nonfiction book for writers and I have a podcast, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, well, that's going to be 80 hours of work and I don't have time to do it. Normally, I would hire a professional for all my fiction. And I had somebody reach out who said, I'd love to read your book. Is it available in audiobook? And then I went, oh, I missed on that because I haven't made it a priority. And that's when I was able to leverage Google Play AI and within a few hours had an audio book that was satisfactory and the author was very, very pleased. But I remember, and, and this was one of the last times we had, had chatted, Michaela was very kind in, in saying, yeah, <laughs> that's good that you did that, but why should that person have to ask? Because it made me think, what about all the people who don't ask? Right. So, so like not, and I know you guys have an audio book in the works and I trust me on this. Sometimes if you're doing it yourself, you still have to schedule it into your schedule or, or even to get an, like one of my narrators, you know, sh she's going to get to it soon. <laughs> so, um, but you have that in the works, but it, it felt like, yeah, I was thinking about it after the fact, like, oh, it's an additional thing. It's not part of the actual product. Right. And, and, and that really helped me open my eyes up. Can you talk a little bit more about that sort of starting, starting with that the basics? Yeah, I think that the, the analogy I used, Mark, was would you buy a car that doesn't have the wheels? Yeah. Uh, and probably the answer is, is, is no, right? Because we perceive a, a car as uh, something that has the wheels on. Yeah. Um, I think that we could write another book probably on accessibility budget. Is, I think is overall the concept that uh, there is an obsolete way to perceive accessibility as an accessory. So accessibility was used to be an often, unfortunately, it is still the case. It is something more that you do. It's like a, a present, like an optional. Uh, yeah, there is a, I mean, the legal industry that forces you to do it, but really that's not part of your process to build, design, to, to implement that software, that digital property, to write that book. I think that this is a very old... Uh, um, concept. Uh, so we should make an effort to consider accessibility as just fully integrated in what we do. Um, it, it is also, a, a, I think, a transition in the concept of budget to dedicate to accessibility. Budget should not be money, but should be time. So okay. simply, as you're considering accessibility, it will take you more time to work on that project is not that will cost you more that is the way the project needs to be done so it will take that time that includes also uh, the audio um, the i mean the, the, the audio transcription and uh, whatever needs to you need to do in order to make the your project fully accessible to people with different abilities mm -hmm. cool. one of the things that uh, ties right into that. And it's something I discussed at the talk that I gave at CSUN was from a, a LinkedIn post that I'd seen uh, from somebody in the, in, in the accessibility community that I, that I follow. Um, and they were talking about an interaction that they had with a company where they, there was something on the site that they could not do. And the response from the company was, we're working on accessibility. We'll get there. Please be patient. And, you know, the idea that if somebody, you know, in the, who isn't disabled came to a site and was trying to buy something and they couldn't click checkout with their mouse and they told the company that the company would probably, you know, immediately go pull people in and make that work. But yet if somebody said, I can't click that button as I'm going with my screen reader, I can't click it you know, with yeah. the controls that I have available to me to get that answer back. And we, you know, we have to move to the idea that that's not acceptable. The bugs are kind of equal, of equal importance. And, you know, so yeah. as we learn these things and start to wrap them in, we're able to be less in that reactive position and more in the proactive position of just making it that way. 
Because once yeah. you start to make it that way, it becomes less time to do it because it's just it's almost muscle memory in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's part of the process as opposed to an, an add-on. It's part of building the car, not the, not, the, not the things that actually make it work work for some people and not for others. Hey, I'm in the car just for the radio, right? <laughs> no, I want to actually go from point A to point B. Um, I want to pop up some comments from from uh, folks actually from our team. So Lexi, who does our social media, says the more I work with visual media, the more I try uh, taking into account understanding clear color choices for better visibility. And I'm sure Lexi's also taking advantage of the alt text option when sharing images on our Twitter feed and stuff like that. And uh, our our graphic designer expert, uh, Lessa says, I use the con contrast checker, checker all the time at, so with webaim.org web slash resource slash contrast checker. Is that is that one of the ones you recommend? Or yeah, where do you that's, that is our yeah. favorite one. Oh, excellent. Perfect. See, thanks, Alyssa, for popping up the link and making it uh, easy for people to click over, over on YouTube <laughs> where you le left that comment. That's fantastic. Um, th and this kind of reminds me. So, you know, we have uh, automated tools that draft to digital, you know, and, and, and print is now open for everyone. It was in beta for a while while we were streamlining it. And we're just at the beginning of all the options for print because we have limited to standard trade paperback, the most common sizes. But... I know that in the future queue, it's clickety click, Barbara Trick, you have a, a large print book, right? And and the great thing about that is the cover design that we'll do for you, because we do that for print. If you have a nice front cover, well, if you have a front cover, <laughs> we're, we're assuming it's nice because you're a professional author, but if you have a front cover, we'll do the cover wrap for you and make sure it's machine perfect. And you can still customize that. But then actually having a tool, if we can build more tools like that to make it more accessible, then that can help authors make their books more accessible because again, hey, we'll give you a free ISBN. You don't have to pay for it. You can just click a button and, and instantly have a large print book available because all eBooks are large print, right? But we know that the majority of readers still read print, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So, and yeah. it's been interesting, you know, in the early days of this book, because it's been out just about a month now, okay. um, the print sales have been, you know, of, of a pace with the eBooks, which yeah, in you know, you're not used to that as a fiction author, are you? As a fiction author, you're right. I'm not used to that, and I'm like, <laughs> well, okay. Um, I'm glad we got this done. You know, and and large print is less than regular print, but it's still right. of a pace that I'm like, okay, it was good that you know that was part of the package going out the door. And it's a great example, you know, going back to the car that this kind of book I would have never put out without the large print going same time as the paperback. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And the audio in the works, knowing that, knowing that that's going to be available relatively soon. So I, I want to get into the, I know it's not related to the topic of the book, but I do want to get into the content because you guys, uh, I mean, you work together, so you already have a working relationship and you know that that works out well, but Jeff, you've only, I mean, fiction has been your primary you know, revenue sources as an author. So this is a, a different kind of project. Michaela, the writing you've done for work has been corporate advice and stuff like that to clients and things like that. I'm just curious how you took your, your different, you obviously have some differences in the way that you approach writing. How did you, how did you, how did you step out how you were going to do this book together? I'm, I'm kind of curious to dig into that a little bit. I can I can probably start, Jeff. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, of course. Uh, being Italian, I was not the uh, checker for Jeff, of course. But <laughs> beside that, um, the the way I approach it, uh, which is kind of often uh, an often attitude for me, is to challenge myself, challenge the way I explain things, and uh, yeah, try to understand the audience. Try to um try to be in their shoes uh in in terms of reception of the message i was trying to convey and um, that probably has been the the biggest revenue for me because i feel that i i learn a lot and has been a um, i don't know how many hours jeff and i spent on uh, just sharing thoughts on how we should communicate this there were pieces, but I'm talking about sentences that probably we spent weeks on just to determine how we can craft this message in a way that 
it doesn't sound techy it doesn't sound uh, <laughs> nerdy it is just as it is uh, and, and communicates uh honestly what we are trying to do yeah it was an interesting shift from fiction and you know it was looking at other non-fiction books especially in the you know it, uh, around writing because those are the ones you know obviously yeah. that i i take in the most so it was looking at you know joanna penn and sasha black and your books and how those non-fiction books are structured okay and then thinking about this topic and trying to give it a little bit of a narrative of you know here's why this is important here's some of the history on it here's things it's good for you to know so you understand why you're doing these things here are the things you need to do and then here's a little bit of a conclusion on the other side of it so that it a little bit of a story you know that can kind of form together with it and then i also i think we redrafted like major redrafts like twice yeah because we knew we weren't presenting the material in a way that was going to be good for this audience because it's a little different how we talk to our usable net clients who have a lot of you know technical support around them you know, designers who've gone to school for design, so they'll understand certain things. Developers, obviously, who have, you know, learned their craft around development. And the people who are not technical at all. You know, and I started putting things through the idea of, I need to present this in a way that if I was explaining it to to Will, he's my husband and, you know, creative business partner as well, he needs to be able to understand what's in this book and feel he could take and do the actions that are in it. And if okay. that's the case, then we have something that should be available to any creative to be able to take the action on. Okay. Uh, so the, the re the revision work was interesting because we had the bones of it fairly quickly. And then it was like just striking the right tone and information balance. It it because it feels like I mean you guys know this world really really well you live it you work with you work with clients you help them see these things because that's you live and breathe it just like you know Alyssa lives and breathes design and aesthetics and stuff like that um, but then I, I think it's you probably had to make it more accessible for people like your husband Will or me or whatever right so that was probably taking that tech understanding that you guys have and then. I mean, did you have readers such as Will uh, mm -hmm. to to actually help and say, as as an author myself, like that kind of thing? I can I can go and go. Oh, I understand what I need to do uh, in these steps. Like, because that that's that's a whole other layer of accessibility, isn't it? Yeah, we went out and I kind of I cherry picked some people. So like Sasha Black read for us. Okay. Um, I had another uh, podcaster blogger uh, who works in the romance space. Okay. look at it because she's run her website for more than a decade now and had her podcast for nearly as long in that space i had an author services person look at it so somebody who you know has a service where they edit and they help authors you know create social media blasts and package arc materials okay. and stuff because she helps create those kinds of materials for people and has newsletters for her own business so she was a great person. Like, do you understand what I put in this book for you? Yeah. <laughs> and luckily, by the time it went to them, the the resounding answer was yes. This makes sense. We got some good feedback, but nobody was like, "I don't understand what you're doing." <laughs> it's good to get. <laughs> and and I think that the the, the very final step uh, was. Uh, also having a highly technical person reading it making sure we were not trivializing the message oh yeah because yeah not lo not losing out on that too right yeah i mean the, the, i think that the overall massive exercise we went through that was um, i think was a learning process was uh, realizing that accessibility speaks many languages and accessibility speaks the language of your audience you can talk about accessibility to a developer in a, you, you should talk to a developer in a different way. You talk about accessibility to an author or a designer or a content manager. So, right. but at all levels, your message needs to make, needs to make sense. At all le levels, they have to perceive that 
that's not just what they have to do for accessibility is what they can do. I mean, it's their part, but there's more in general that potentially can be done. So this is why in the book you will find the references to this is something maybe your developers should do, or if you don't have, let's ignore it for the moment. But it is important to, to make sure that um, persons understand the size of, of the topic. Uh, we, both Jeff and I, are, uh, are, have a constant battle against who tries to, to simplify too much and hide the rest of the, uh, yeah, of the topic. Yeah. yeah, and in an interesting full circle moment, like the the way that we wrote this book and some of the ways we talk about accessibility in the book is looping back into the trainings we have for content people that we give at UsableNet. Like, oh, it's really interesting how we positioned it here. What if we did something similar but tweaked it a little bit for that? So now that this book's out, since I work on our training program i'm now revising the content training with some of this new way to think about talking about things and it's 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 interesting how it all just kind of you know feeds back on itself cool so um, i want to go to authors who are still feeling a little bit intimidated uh, and i know i think you mentioned earlier in this conversation it's progressive steps rather than all or none perfection, that kind of thing. So any little thing you can do can help. But where are some of the places that an author, let's say an author who's already published, has some books out, what are the things they could look at? What are the things that they can do? And maybe what are some of those small steps they can start taking to help make their content, uh, existing content, whether it's the books they've published, their website, their social media, any of those things that are meant to be consumed, <laughs> uh, how they can make that a little bit more accessible. What are some of the steps you usually recommend where they start? I think the, the there's two that I would give off the top and uh, that I think pay attention to your colors. We've talked about color contrast a couple of times. Yeah. Really pay attention to the colors that you're using anywhere. You know, what is the color palette of your website? What is the background versus the text? What is the color contrast for the images that you're putting put you're putting out? You know, does it meet the requirements so that for people who are engaging visually, that they can understand what's there? Because for people, for example, who are dyslexic, sharp color contrast makes it easier to parse the words for them. And okay. you know, there are other uh, cognitive disabilities that would play into that as well. But also low vision people, the sharper the color contrast, the better shot that they're going to have to engage with it, whether it's on the screen or in an image or somewhere else. So really, because I see too many authors and creatives like, this looks really cool, but you can't read it. <laughs> and so if you can't read it, there's not really a point to it. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and the other one I would say is really mind alternative text. Um, I think one of the larger sections in the book is about alternative texts. Okay. So Can you I explain give... what that is a little bit just for people who don't know what that is? Thank you for making me explain it more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so alternative text is what you use anytime you put an image online. You need to think about what somebody who can't perceive the image visually needs to know from it. Very often we just use them decoratively and you would leave the alternative text empty if you can. Yeah. On WordPress, for example, there's a little checkbox that says this image is decorative. It doesn't need alternative text or something to that effect. Yeah. Other times you're going to want it to, to explain what somebody would need to know. Uh, and But often like with book covers and stuff, it'd just be empty. Read the book for all about alternative text because I could do like an hour on alternative <laughs> okay. text. All right. But to expand on where I'm headed with this is especially in a newsletter, for example, if the image is key to the message in the newsletter, you've got to put some alternative text in it so that the user who can't see it can understand it. Or you have to make sure the information from that image is live text in the newsletter, maybe one way or the other okay. to be able to present it. Social media, this is super important because Facebook and Instagram will generate alternative text for you. Yeah, I've seen that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
and it's never what you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not. It may. It may actually not be the message you want to get across, right? I assure you that it's not. <laughs> For example, <laughs> when I was when I was at CSUN, I posted a picture that somebody had taken of my um, talk. It was me standing next to the screen. The title slide was up. You could see in front of the photographer a couple of people sitting um, in front of them. So back of the heads. Facebook generated something like maybe image of three people, one standing. Okay. <laughs> no context. <laughs> no context. Not where the event was, you know. So right. you have to put something there, even if you've said everything in the post. So starting to think about those things and right. how to do it, because you're always wanting to create meaningful alt text. Okay. To go with the image, to help people who can't see it, understand it. One more thing I'll throw out there too. Last one, and then I'll let Michaela give some. <laughs> Images of text. So when you bake the, the text into the image, which, you know, like po the popular thing to do these days for authors is the book in the middle of a square and then all these little arrows pointing to it with different plot points around it. Yeah, yeah. All of that text that you put in that block needs to be in your post. Because if they can't see that text in the block, for whatever reason, color contrast issues, font usage, whatever, just yeah. put it, restate it differently in the post. So they're complementary to each other. So people don't miss out. Anyway, and, I'll and, get off my soapbox now. I'll let Michaela get on. But I think <laughs> um, I want to help authors understand why, why, you know, because if you're visually impaired, there are programs that read screens, correct? Exactly. And they yeah. look for the alt text HTML tags. Mm -hmm. I'm not a tech guy, but they, they read those when they're reading the screen. So you're like, oh, I get it. The image is this. Therefore, it's a joke. Therefore, it matches the text. Even if it's not in the text, the alt text helps them understand, oh, it was a meme about the cat and the and the ladies yelling, right? You know, the, the, the one you always see all the time, like maybe yeah. something like that. It's It's funny because now I can appreciate it too, right? Exactly. Exactly. You have to think about with the images of text the other layers that go into it. So an alternative text won't solve for all of that because yeah. somebody who's of low vision may not use a screen reader. They may oh. try to, to, to understand and maybe the color contrast is blocking them from understanding it or the font use is understanding is right. blocking their understanding because maybe it's too curly and fancy or they may have dyslexia or some other cognitive impairments where they don't perceive what's in an image as well as they would just plain text on the screen that they can manipulate more. Uh, yeah. So all of that has to kind of be think thought about because we give in the book for each of the things we tell you to do, we tell you the impairments that, you know, have an improvement because of what you've done. And for many of them, you know, it, it, there's a, there's something that solves for a visual impairment, a cognitive impairment and a motor impairment all with the same fix because all of it kind of you know stacks up together everything kind of connects to all the impairment groups very often um so it all you know fits together nicely which is why you can solve for so many people by doing one thing that seems way more efficient oh yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> yeah. uh yeah, so I yeah, I think that Jeff covered a lot. So I, I'm going to just touch one uh, practical point, and then I'll, I'll I'll be the philosophical guy here. So in terms of practical point, the the phone family you you choose. Uh, so yeah. for example, consider if you use a phone family where the uh, letter L is different than the capital I and the number one. That will help a lot people that have oh, yeah. uh, dyslexia or other kind of uh, cognitive disabilities. It is an easy thing to do. It's just changing a phone family. Uh, nothing more than that. But it will it will help a lot. And here it comes my, my philosophical and hopefully not useless comment. Jeff and I have been spending the, I would say, a big portion of our life uh, focusing on accessibility. Yeah. We still learn every single day. So don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, we, tr we truly believe in our message, progress over perfection. 
when you do something, it can be very little, but do it right. Do not rely on uh, wizards that says, well, yeah, we'll make your site accessible with one click or use uh, artificial intelligence to for the alternative text for all your images that will will take that uh, um, off your table. Right. Do what you can and try to do it in the right way. That will improve uh, necessarily your uh, your your product. I'm I'm curious about some of the AI that may suggest for Instagram or whatever, you know, so I'm going to use Jeff's example. The AI suggested, you know, two men, there are two people, maybe one male standing or whatever the thing was, is a start, you know, and it's a tool and you go, oh, okay, that, so I'm going to describe you know, two people sitting in chairs, one person on stage, screen, so you, you kind of have a, a some place to start because I wonder if people who've never played with it know what they're expected to put in. Like, do I describe every intricate detail or do you, how do you focus on what's important that maybe yeah. that Maybe that helps you get started. It, it, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that artificial intelligence doesn't work. It, it works in in many areas. Yeah. The, the problem with artificial intelligence associated to images alternative text is that in your process to determine what is the best way to describe the image, you cannot ignore the context where the image sits. So if the image is in the page. Your, your your goal is not just describe the image, but describe the function of the image within the context of the page. What is the function of the image in, the, in that page? It is yeah. conveying an additional message. So yes, you have to describe with the alternative text that message. Is the image just decorative, as Jeff mentioned before? Well, you don't need to describe it. You just um, set an alternative text, which is empty. So the screen reader will ignore it. And there won't be any redundant information. Gotcha. Consider the, the importance of, uh, I mean, consider the effort that, for example, a blind user using a screen reader needs to put in place in order to process an entire page. So why adding information that is not relevant? Yeah. If we can see, it is a matter of microseconds to process right. and, uh, and let's say classify important information versus decorative information. A blind person doesn't have this luxury. So it needs to listen and then determine, but without knowing what will, will come after uh, what the screen reader has just, uh, just read. So it is kind of a matter of being responsible in, mm -hmm. in the way we are Mm, we are conveying our messages uh, through all the media we might we might use. I love that. Um, I have to pop this up because it's sort of related. As Alyssa said, it doesn't matter how cool your design is if it's not it's not cool if a person can't take it in, right? I saw that go by in the comments. I'm like, I hope he puts that up there. Yeah, <laughs> <'Cause> that's <laughs> so true. There were so many other <laughs> comments not related to our conversation at all. Thank you, Alyssa and Lexi, for answering them, and Jim. But uh, uh, the other thing I remember, and 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 this this struck me, Michaela, the last time we spoke as well, is you had mentioned the there's an economic value for a content creator in considering accessibility, right? It's not just it's not just being nice and open and ensuring other people can, but there's a really important economic value for the content creator, right? Like just by having that stuff available. Yeah. I mean, there is uh, just doing some uh, approximation, consider 20% of the population as a sort of disability. And this 20% doesn't include people that might have a temporary disability, right? Uh, somebody that broke uh, her glasses or consider the uh, disabilities that are induced by the context of use. So I, I have my screen that is hit by the sun, and if the, the color contrast is not optimal, I might not be able to perceive in the right way the, the, the information on the website. Right. And consider just all the, um, all the aspects related of people simply getting older. In particular, uh, the, the, if you think about the, the age of the web population is getting every year older and older. And the pandemic that we have all gone through um, exposed a lot more 
uh, the, the web to, uh, to, to people of any age. And their expectation is to be able to keep doing what they are doing now in 10 years. So, but their, their function probably will be a little bit degraded. So there is definitely a business case around accessibility. If it is not enough, just the, let's say, the, the ethical impact or the fact that it just makes sense. Yeah, awesome. And uh, I guess we're getting really close to the end. I want to thank you, gentlemen, so much for coming on. Uh, remind people in audio, please, where they can find out more about your awesome new book that authors should be checking out. Absolutely. You can find it at contentforeveryone.info. Uh, awesome. You'll be able to find our blog there. You'll be able to find all the places uh, where the book is available, which of course is really everywhere that you can get an ebook or a paperback. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, we'll keep it updated with other places where we're talking about, uh, you know, other podcasts and programs that we're on. If people want to follow us around as we keep talking about it, because we definitely want to, we kind of want to start a revolution here uh, yeah. with creatives to really get on board and start making their content more accessible, but also for the creatives who start doing it as they see things out in the world with their colleagues gently approach them and say, hey, I noticed you did this thing. If you think about doing it this way, it'll be more accessible for more of your audience. Um, because nobody's really talking about this in this space. All of the all the buzz is with large companies making the e-commerce sites or the restaurant sites or the healthcare mm -hmm. sites more accessible. And it it definitely needs to be had there too. But really everyone who's posting on the web has I would say a responsibility to make it as accessible as they can while they're doing it. Awesome. Well, thank you again, gentlemen, for taking the time to share with our audience. Um, and thank you, audience, for uh, participating. Be sure to bookmark uh, d2dlives.com so you don't miss out on awesome guests like Jeff and Michele and their uh, book content for everyone. Gentlemen, thanks again for, uh, for hanging out with me today. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thanks, everybody, at Draft to Digital. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.